In this episode of the FXTM educational series, we're going to be taking a look at trading strategies. Now, what I'm going to do is to illustrate some key concepts, so on a step-by-step -step basis, as to how do traders deal with and create trading strategies in the first place. And I'm going to do it by showing you an example of a trading strategy as well. So I like to separate this up into a couple of steps. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to start with step number one, which is to build our rules. So a rule set is just what is the strategy? What is the signal that we're using to indicate whether or not a trader should be buying or selling, shorting, closing their trade, uh, or what have you? Now, the system that I'm going to illustrate here is actually a very common one. We're going to be looking at technical divergences. So I'm going to walk you through the basic ideas behind a long entry and a short entry as an example. Now, in step number one here, if we're trying to define our, our entry signal, I'm going to use a bearish divergence, and then I'm also going to tackle a bullish divergence as well. So let's just walk through the rules for a bullish entry. Now, initially, and here what I've done is I've got the black line here that represents basically the price, so the exchange rate itself. And as you can see, the price of the exchange rate has been forming higher highs, while at the same time, and here I've drawn a diagram of a stochastics oscillator, which we're going to take a much closer look at here in just a minute on the charts. Well, at the same time that the price has been forming higher highs, the stochastics oscillator, which ranges, it's a line that ranges between 0 and 100, and when it gets above about 80, that's sometimes uh, called an overbought region. Now, it's meaningful when it's overbought if at the same time the, that the uh, exchange rate here is forming higher highs, if the stochastics indicator is forming lower highs at the same time. So this is a bearish divergence. And an investor would look at this as a bearish entry signal. So that would be part of a rule set here for a short entry or potentially as an exit signal. Now, a long entry would be similar except just in reverse. So imagine here, for example, that we have a price that has been declining in value, the exchange rate, and it's been forming lower lows, while at the same time, we actually have higher lows on the oscillator. So in this case, the stochastics. So if we get a lower lows on the price of the exchange rate, higher lows on the stochastics oscillator, well, that's a bullish divergence. So a trader would use that as a signal to go long that particular exchange rate or uh, alternatively, this could also be seen as an exit signal from a trader who's in a short position and the bullish divergence is basically telling them that their expectation is that the market is going to continue to the upside. Now, in both cases, there's a rule of thumb here that will actually help improve the overall uh, performance of a system like this. And I bring it up because it should generally be a component of most trading systems, especially those that where you're trying to take advantage of the trend. And it is, in fact, the trend. So if the trend is very supportive for the trade entry, so let's say in this example that you get a bearish divergence like this, and although the market has been recently moving higher, the long-term trend was actually negative. Well, if the longer-term trend was actually negative, or in this case, the longer-term trend was actually very positive, and it had just recently pulled back into this little divergence, that helps to put the odds a little further in favor of a trader who's looking to be able to enter a long position there, or in this case, a short position here. Is, are those signals conforming to the bias of that longer term trend? So let's take a look at a couple of specific examples on the charts of both a bearish divergence and a bullish divergence. You can see the setup that I was discussing at the whiteboard here in this chart with the Australian dollar to the US dollar currency pair the long-term trend was in fact negative. Now, the currency pair had started to rally a little bit in April and May of 2015, where the price was actually making slightly higher highs, while at the same time, as you can see here on the stochastics indicator, it's actually making lower highs. Now, that's a classic example of a bearish divergence, and it was completed on the 18th of May when the stochastics fast line crossed below its slow line. Now, ultimately, the exchange rate dropped by about 560 pips to the downside before it started finding a little bit of support. But ultimately, it, the exchange rate actually dropped at 1,257 pips before finding a temporary bottom in September. 
Now the example here that we have of a bullish divergence, once again, we're gonna to defer to that longer term trend. So you can see here with the pound to the yen exchange rate, we have a longer term trend to the upside. Now between the end of March and about the middle of April, we started to see a couple of bottoms forming on the price or the exchange rate itself. Now these bottoms, the second one was actually deeper than the first one. However, that was not matched by the bottoms on the stochastics oscillator. So as you can see here, the oscillator was actually forming higher lows. Well, those lower lows on the price and those higher lows on the oscillator, that's the nature of a bullish divergence. Now eventually the exchange rate actually rallied about 2000 pips before reaching resistance in June. Now, once we've come up with a trading idea, something that seems to make sense, what we need to do is to move on to step number two, which is backtesting. Now, backtesting is basically what we do when we are going back into historical data and we're applying our rule set, so our trading idea, to that historical data to see, well, how would that have worked uh, in the past? Now, backtesting can contain certain risks and problems in that investors sometimes over-optimize a little bit or they make assumptions about the data in the past that may be so refined and so precise that they're not very good representations of what we should expect in the future. So generally speaking, what I would suggest when you're backtesting to try to eliminate some of those problems is to do essentially three things. So number one is to test your trading system over different time periods. So for example, if you have a trading system that relies on daily bars or something like that, well, uh, uh, try to apply the same trading system to hourly bars or even 10 or 15 minute bars, something like that to see whether or not this may be just a fluke or an anomaly. Now, not only that, but also test your system over different market conditions. So when we say time periods, well, you might have found that something worked really well this year. We'll go back five years in the past and look at that historical data and see, did it still work five years ago as well? Because we don't know when the market conditions of five years ago may actually wind up reasserting themselves. Uh, number two is if you have a system that you've developed on, let's say, a particular currency pair like the euro dollar or something like that, well, test it on different pairs. So by doing this, you'll be able to improve your confidence that this isn't something that may just be an anomaly or where you're doing a little bit of overfitting. If it works, for example, on the euro dollar, but does not work for whatever reason on the dollar yen or uh, the euro yen or something like that, well, that may be telling you something about the validity of your rules and potentially, of course, the the potential for success in the future. And then finally, make sure that you're doing a large enough test in the sense of sample size. So a large sample size doesn't have to be hundreds and hundreds of trades, but it should certainly be more than just a couple. So for example, we might defer to some of the traditional things that we know about statistical sampling. So looking at trades uh, or a sample set of at least more than 30 instances is going to help to improve your confidence level that whatever system that you're backtesting, that the results that you're getting from historical data is likely to uh, essentially be replicated into the future. But the larger your sample size is, the more confident you can be that that is in fact going to be the case. The smaller your sample size is, the more likely it is you may be dealing with an outlier or some kind of an anomaly. Now in step number three, we're going to talk about risk control. Now I think that there are really two important components of risk control that we need to think about. Uh, the first one, of course, is what you might imagine, which is where's my stop loss? At what point do I assume that if the trade has gone against me, I want to get out of this trade and just assume that the analysis is dead, that it's no good. The second level, of course, is where do I think that the trade is done in the sense that I've reached a likely profit objective and I want to remove my risk by taking my profits off the table. So this would be the first component here of risk control. Now let's take a look at a specific example of what we mean by a stop loss with this system that we've been evaluating here in this video. So if we revisit this trade on the pound yen, just after that divergence was actually confirmed on the 15th, let's imagine that an investor was evaluating an entry on the 16th. 
Well, if the price had not actually risen, but instead had reversed and begun to decline and had taken out the low of that divergence, which occurred on the 14th of April, you can see that here, the low price at the time was 174.866. So their stop loss would have been placed a little over 200 pips to the downside from their entry point. Because the assumption is that if that second low had actually been taken out with a third lower low, well, that divergence is apparently not working out. Now, the second aspect here of risk control is position sizing. Position sizing is oftentimes overlooked, but it helps to stay consistent. So it's not uncommon for a trader to feel really confident about a particular trade so they get in very heavy or to feel very scared of a particular trade and so they get in very, very light. And they, since they can't predict the future, they wind up sabotaging themselves a little bit or at least risking the uh, sabotaging themselves because they don't know which of those two trades ultimately could be their big winner. So position sizing becomes really key. Now, we can approach this uh, very simply. It's not very complicated. And one of the common ways to do this is by uh, evaluating each trade as a fractional percentage of your overall account equity. So let's put ourselves in the example of a hypothetical trader here. Let's say that there was a hypothetical trader and she had account equity of $10,000. Now, she had decided that in any single position, she was willing to put at risk 5% of her overall account equity. So we'll say here the upper limit as far as the position size is 5% of 10,000. Well, if we times 5% by 10,000, then we find out that this trader, at least right now, is willing to put at risk $500. Now, that's part of our question here. We want to be able to answer what is the amount of money in notional terms that this trader is willing to put at risk in a particular trade. But we need to know what the stop loss is or what the expected loss is in a particular trade before we can translate this into an actual position size in terms of how many lots. So let's say that a trader here, that their stop loss, they've decided that they're willing to give up 110 pips. So 110 pips. Now, to keep our math nice and easy, let's say that, we're, that this trader is using uh, mini lots where each pip, in, in this case, is worth a dollar. So it, because of the currency pair that they're actually trading, we'll say that the uh, dollar is on the base side of that, so that each pip will be worth a dollar. So what we would do is we would take this $500, we're going to divide it by 110 pips because we know that's where the stop loss is. Now, if we do that, of course, we'll find out that we uh, wind up being about... Uh, going into from 110 going into 500 goes in about 4.5 times. So that means that a trader here, if they wanted to maintain a consistent position size of 5% of their account equity, and as their account equity grows, of course, their position size in dollar terms is going to continue to go up. But this way, this trader knows that this position deserves a size of, let's say, four mini lots and five micro lots. So that would equal exactly what their position size was planned to be in notional terms. Now, our last objective here is to develop an expectancy and to actually keep that expectancy up to date. So what does this actually mean? Well, expectancy is a way for us to think about what to expect over time from our average winners and losers and what's the difference between the two. So let's think about this. Now, we, we need to know two things about our at least our back testing when we initially start and then on an ongoing basis, well, in our forward testing, if you will, what are these two ratios uh, looking like then as well? The first one is a win to loss ratio. Now, our win to loss ratio, what does this mean? Well, it basically means what percentage of the time do we win and what percentage of the time do we lose? So let's just do a hypothetical here. Let's say that a trader is winning about 30% of the time and they are losing about 70% of the time. All right, now that may not look very good, but uh, we have another ratio to cover here. So what does the risk to reward look like? Now this can definitely change the uh, way that a particular trading system is really performing regardless of what its win-loss ratio looks like. So let's say that when a trader is right, that they're right to the tune of about $2,000. So we'll just say hypothetically here. So hypothetically, they uh, stand to be rewarded on average about $2,000 for a winning trade. And when they're wrong, they wind up losing about $500.
Now we have all the information that we need to develop an expectancy. And the way that we do that is we multiply the potential loss by the amount at risk, the potential for a winner and the amount of reward, and then we're gonna net those out. So let's do that. We'll do the uh, loss and the risk first. So the 0.7 for 70% times 500 gives us an average loss here. So on any given trade, we think on average, that that's gonna lose $350 if we weight this, assuming that the other 30% are winners. All right, now in a given trade, we would assume that the winners, so we're gonna times 0.3 for 30% times 2,000, times 2,000 equals $600. All right, now what we wanna do at this point is we wanna make sure, and our objective here is to make sure that our expectancy is positive. So how do we know? Well, all we need to do is just net these two numbers out. So over time, if we have a positive expectancy, then that means that our weighted winner is larger than our weighted loser. So in this case, it is to the tune of about $250 per trade. So what does that mean? That basically means that on an average basis, an average trade, a trader would have an expectancy of earning $250 on average. Now that doesn't, that $250 is not equal to their winners, which are much larger. And it's obviously not the same as their losers, which are negative. What this tells us is if it's positive, then a trader would assume that there's a, a certain likelihood that they'll be able to be profitable in the future.